Okay, hello. Welcome, everybody. We're going to wait a couple of minutes to let people trickle in before we actually start. So thanks for taking some time out of your day to hang out with us on this webinar. And um, a couple of housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded, and you'll be able to watch the recording later using the same link that you used to register for watching the webinar now. Cody and I are going to answer questions at the end. Zoom has this Q&A button, so please put your questions there at any time that you like, and we will answer those questions at the end. And we're just going to wait like one, maybe two more minutes until we actually start, just to let people have a, a chance to to join. So if you see on the um, on the screen there, there is a link that you can use here. If you want to follow along with the deck, um, you can do that on your side. There are links in the deck as well. So it'll be a whole lot easier to click on those links if you bring up the deck. So I would encourage you to navigate to this bit.ly link here uh, so that you can um, click those links and you can follow along. And we'll just wait a few more seconds before we before we start. Looks like we do have some people still still joining. Um, I think we'll I think we'll go ahead and get started. And so again, thanks for taking time out of your day to hang out with us on this webinar. We're going to be talking about a new feature in Bloodhound that's in both Bloodhound Enterprise and also Bloodhound Community Edition. And it has to do with um, how we are mapping the relationships that emerge when uh, user synchronization has been set up. And so uh, just a quick uh, little introduction uh, for the two of us. Uh, my name is Andy Robbins. I'm a product architect at SpectreOps, and I'm one of the uh, original co-creators of Bloodhound, which we initially released back in 2016. And you can find me on Twitter there at that um, at underscore Waldo with a zero handle. And Cody, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Uh, Cody Thomas. Um, also, if you do the Twitter game, I'm at it's a feature, but there's actually an underscore at the end. Um, that's kind of not on the slide, so um, that's okay. But I am been in Spectre Ops for almost six years now, doing a lot of red teaming, teaching. I developed Mythic and some of the agents that go along with it. And so that's kind of my role here in helping out with Andy for this webinar, is showing you more of the implementation side of things and how we can do it in, in a C2 framework. All right, so I fixed the deck, but it didn't update the slide. So people with the link, you'll be able to see Cody's correct handle. And then we'll send a follow-up email that'll have the correct link to, to Cody's Twitter profile as well. All right. So um, the hybrid identity future is here. And it is manifesting in different ways. And one of those ways is through Microsoft user synchronization from on-prem Active Directory to Microsoft Intra-ID. Admins can configure uh, either IntraConnect or IntraCloud Sync to start to synchronize users from on-prem AD up into Intra. And uh, regardless of whichever of those options they go with, both of those technologies support user synchronization. Both of them support password hash synchronization. Both of them support password writeback. We're going to be talking a lot about password hash sync and password write back in this webinar. However, there is other tradecraft and there is emerging tradecraft that allows abuse of these configurations without actually having to manipulate or have access to any credential material uh, at any point. So we'll talk in more detail about that later. Okay, why does this matter? So this matters because 
for the first time in the product, we are introducing these kind of cross-platform attack paths. For the past several years, Bloodhound has had a Active Directory model, and it has had an Intra and Azure model, but they were completely distinct. So with synchronized users, we are connecting those two parts of the database for the first time. And so that, synchroni that synchronization of those users, it brings along with it a synchronization of the risk of either platform because in almost every instance, the compromise of one user can result in the compromise of another user when those users are being synchronized. Another reason this matters is because these relationships, they create what, what I would refer to as an implicit and obscure trust. So maybe there's no trust relationship really between on-prem AD and intra, but when we have the user synchronization process happening, there's this kind of implicit trust that emerges where each platform, their security posture is affected by the other and they are in a way trusting each other to have a security posture that is appropriate given the risk of whatever those platforms are supporting as far as the business goes. And then this gets even worse because with Intra Cloud Sync, we can actually synchronize users from disparate forests that the on-prem Active Directory forests may have no trust or knowledge of one another, but they can synchronize up into the same Intra tenant. And then you're talking about hopping from one platform to another to another. And so in that way, this web of interconnected identities and hybrid attack paths, it can have a devastating impact on the security posture of environments that don't even know that they have this kind of implicit trust with each other. To support this feature, we have introduced two new classes of Edge. The first one is synced to intra user, and that starts at the on-prem user and it goes towards the intra user. And there are several different ways how this may be abused. Maybe there's password hash synchronization and those users have the same password. Maybe there's certificate-based authentication and the on-prem user is able to authenticate as the intra user using a certificate. Maybe there's ADFS, maybe there's pass-through authentication, whatever. In almost every single instance, the same abuse primitive can emerge where the on-prem user is able to access or create a bearer token, which is valid for authenticating as the intra user. And so compromise of the on-prem user can almost always mean compromise of the intra user as well. The second class of edge that we're introducing is called synced to AD user. This goes from the intra user back down to the on-prem active directory user. The attack paths that can emerge here are a little bit different and rely on some configurations being in place currently. The most obvious con consideration is if password write back is enabled, then changing the password of the entry user may cause the on-prem user's password to be updated to the same value. So having control of the intra user can then turn into control of the on-prem Active Directory user as well. There are other uh, abuse primitives that are possible, which we will reference that uh, some of our colleagues in the industry have written about. So I wanna show you a couple of examples of real attack paths from real environments that we've been able to use Bloodhound to identify. This first one here, you can see that it starts here in the bottom left where the domain users group has admin rights on a computer. So we can pivot to that computer and run commands as system on that computer. That computer has a user logged on and it's an on-prem active directory user. That, us that user is synchronized to an intra user. And so because 
of that synchronization relationship. And because we are local admin on this computer, we're going to be able to ride the existing behavior that enables this on-prem user to authenticate as the entry user. And you'll see details about how exactly that happens when Cody demonstrates the attack path. The entry user, and remember, this is a real attack path from a real environment. This entry user has the privileged role admin role that allows the user to add a secret to an intra app registration. This app registration was then published into another intra tenant. And when that happens, that application manifests as a service principal object in the other tenant. With a secret stored on this app registration, we can actually authenticate as this service principal and perform actions in this other tenant. And in this real example, in this real environment, the service principal had the global admin role. So from domain user to global admin in an intra ID tenant that had no knowledge and no trust built with the original on-prem active directory domain. The next example is also a real example from a real environment. And it's the path that we are actually going to demonstrate during this webinar. So in this instance, we're actually going from on-prem AD into intra and then back into on-prem AD. So this computer has a session for the user who is synchronized to an intra user that has control of an app registration. We can add a credential here, which then means we can authenticate as this service principal here. This service principal in the real environment has the ability to uh, promote itself to global admin based on an MS Graph app role assignment that the service principal has active. Global admin can do everything, including resetting other user passwords, creating users, promoting users to different roles, et cetera. This intra user was then synchronized back down to an on-prem AD user and password write back was enabled. And so from our initial starting point, then we could authenticate as the on-prem user. This on-prem user had full control of the domain admins group. And so we can add ourselves to the domain admins group and it's game over at that point. It's full control of the on-prem active directory and along the way, full control of the intra and Azure environments. We can find these attack paths using Bloodhound Community Edition and Bloodhound Enterprise. Uh, this is from Bloodhound Communi Community Edition. And in this screenshot, we have started from the J Frank user. If you've ever used Google Maps, the UX here is the same way. So you start uh, with a start destination. It's the J Frank user. And the end destination is the domain admins group in the same domain where the user exists. This path shows exactly what we were looking at on the previous slide, where the path starts at JSON, goes up into intra, goes back down into on-prem AD, and then finally lands at the domain admins group. So I'm going to pass things over to Cody. And Cody and I are going to explain the step-by-step -step process for how this attack path is actually executed. So I will stop sharing and I'll pass it over to you, Cody, for you to share. All right. All right, so this is the same slide that we're just looking at. This is the end-to-end -end goal of what we're gonna do. Now, in the next slides, we're gonna break it down into just highlighting a small piece of this graph at a time, breaking it down step-by-step -step. And for each step, we'll then have a video showing how we can actually do this. So look at the demo. So the first thing we're going to do, like Andy said, first we get execution context as the JFrank user on-prem on a host. Um, in our example, we'll have an Apollo callback to the Mythic C2 framework as the JFrank user, just in a standard medium integrity context. Then what we're going to do, because that JFrank user has the ability to sync to entry user, we're going to 
get the authentication material that Andy was talking about that allows us to connect to Entra. In this case, this is the bearer token, a JWT, essentially. So if we look over here at our demo video, so this is the Mythic 3.3 uh, UI. If you're familiar with Cobalt Strike or many other C2 platforms, it should look pretty familiar. We have our callbacks up here at the top, and we're interacting with them here. So the task game we're going to see is down here at the bottom, and it pops up as we issue tasks. So we're going to go ahead and issue a who am I just to kind of see you know, our current user context. We are indeed J Frank. Uh, yep, you can see that here. You can see what sort of groups and permissions and stuff we have. Nothing too crazy. And then we're going to go ahead and start issuing part of this attack path. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the Azure AD to go ahead and initiate that kind of log on into the Entra um, system. So this can cause a pop-up on the target system where you have to select a specific uh, subscription that you're going to use. So in our case, we clicked go ahead and continue. So you can see a little pop-up here saying select which one, and we get information about which specific uh, subscription we're going to be using. Then we're going to use the uh, Active Directory user list that allows us to go through and not just log in, but actually connect up and get a uh, cached tokens that we're then going to pick up in the next step. So that's just refreshing our credential material on disk. Now we need to actually extract and get that material. So what we're going to do is we're going to use PowerShell again. And these tokens are protected by DP API. So since we are in that JFrank user context, we can use PowerShell pointing at this Azure token uh, binary cache. We're going to get the content of the path and then just use DP API's unprotect functionality to automatically go ahead and pull these apart and decrypt them. And we're going to print them to the screen for us. That's what we're looking at here. You get a lot of different stuff back that you can parse through. But the part we're most interested in is that top part there, the access token. You get back a couple of different tokens here. But the one we're interested in is the one that Andy mentioned specifically that's for interacting with the graph API. So you can see this here. This uh, lists out a lot of different graph permissions that we get. And it has that secret, which is actually our JWT bearer token. This is just so, one way. Uh, this is just one yeah. way showing how we can um, abuse the mechanics of the Azure binary to refresh and to uh, steal a cached token from disk. But there are many other ways to do this exact same uh, this exact same step, or the user may have already. Um, authenticated using the AZ binary. And in that case, we can just go ahead and steal the tokens from disk as the adversary. Yeah, a lot of the reason that we're doing the that uh, user list up here is just making sure for the process of this demo that we have newly refreshed uh, tokens and they aren't going to expire as we issue a command. So that was part one and part two. So now that we have the token for the user up here in the Entra system, now we actually need to start interacting with Entra and doing things. So here, Andy mentioned that our JFrank account owns this uh, autom IAM automation um, account. So this uh, application object, we're able to create a new credential on it. So it's pretty straightforward. We come over here. We can look at step three. So here we have that same uh, output from before, that secret. We're going to go ahead, just to make things a bit clearer in the UI, instead of having these massive uh, JWT blobs everywhere, what we're going to use a couple times throughout this, um, this demo is we're going to save these tokens off into PowerShell environment variables so it's easier to see the parts that go through. So that's what we're doing here is we're taking that JWT and just kind of saving it off for easier reference. Um, and then we're going to be using this new Entra app secret. Now, this is actually a PowerShell functionality that's part of Bark, which is another tool um, that we're going to be leveraging through a lot of this uh, project. 
So we'll import Bark just like you would in you know, Cobalt Trick. We're going to do a PowerShell import, select the file, load it in. And then we'll go ahead and use that um, new Entra application secret. We pass in that token that we copied from before with this uh, application object ID for that IAM automation um, object that we were just looking at. And you can see here on success, we get this new secret value, this new credential that we're going to be using. This will pop up a bunch in these subsequent steps. So that's why you'll see me keep coming back to this. Yeah, and the, the reason that we're adding this to the app registration object is the user in this demo and the user in the real environment was added as an explicit owner of the app registration. So they didn't have an intro role uh, assigned to them, but they were added as an explicit owner to this object. What that lets them do is like what Cody just showed is we can add a new credential to the app. And then the app is going to have an associated service principle along with it. That service principle can be authenticated using a secret that is stored not on the service principle, but on the app registration instead. So that's why we that's why this attack path flows the way that it does. So the next step, as Andy just mentioned, we're going to now that we created a new credential and we have that plain text credential available to us, we can use it to authenticate as the backing service principle. So that's what we'll see here. Um, it should look pretty familiar to a lot of other things that we're going to be doing. We'll go ahead. I wish I would stop minimizing. We'll go ahead and right from that spot where we have the that plain text password, we're going to be using the another command like here, the get MS graph token with client credentials. So this is specifically using that client secret that we identified right here that I'm copying, and then the client ID for that application. So we just supply those couple of parameters. And you can see down here at the bottom, I'm doing the same sort of thing we did before, where we get back a credential object, but really what we're going to be passing around is the access token for it. So I go ahead and save that off into an environment variable to make things a bit kind of cleaner for this demo. So you can see here, again, it looks just like a JWT. Um, and I'll go ahead and just echo it out again to show that we did save it off into our environment, it makes it a bit easier to use. Um, in our subsequent steps. So I'm going to continue on and we're going to go ahead and use that token to then actually give our, uh, let me pause it. We're going to give our new uh, account that we authenticated as, we're going to upgrade its permissions. We're going to give it a new um, role assignment that we we're talking about before. This is one of the things that Andy was talking about where we can give it like global administrator permissions. It already had the ability to do it. We just kind of enable them for us. So that's what we're doing here. That principal ID, give it that role definition, which is the administrators. And here we can see that, yep, we now have a new ID. This has been granted to us. So that's here, we're going to authenticate and promote it to global admin. That's the yeah. aspect of providing that. And I said this before, but just to repeat it again now, the, the reason why this service principle can promote itself to global admin is because it has a particular MS Graph app role called role management dot read write dot directory. So that lets the service principle promote itself or any other principle to any intra role. This is also why the lab environment refers to the service principle and its app as like I am automation is because there are many third party I am automation tools out there that give themselves this level of privilege during setup. So this is a common target that an adversary may want to uh, focus on uh, are applications like this. And there are many different vendors that, that do have intra applications that have this kind of power in intra. Yeah. And so as we go through and we authenticate, we're getting back these access tokens. 
these access tokens have very explicit permissions that are granted with them. So now that we change the permissions associated with this account, one of the first things we're going to need to do for our next step is actually re-authenticate and get an updated token that reflects our newer permissions. So that's why it, it'll look like for a second that we go back and do something that we just did. It's just because we're refreshing our tokens with to reflect our greater permissions. Yeah. So, oh, good. Oh, I was just going to mention the this next part and explain why mm -hmm. we're creating a new user. So the next step that you can see in the intact path here is from the role to the user, it says AZ reset password. And certainly we have the ability to change the password of the D McGuire user, which is an intra user. However, uh, currently the only way to do this where the password will then write back down to on-prem AD requires us to submit a token to a particular endpoint, and that token must be associated with a user, not with a service principal. So because of that, we need to first create a user, and then we need to give that user the ability to reset David's password. So that's why we are creating a new user and promoting it, as opposed to just resetting the password as the service principal. Yeah, it's a fine nuance there. And we'll we'll show all these steps too. So this is that the first part where we're going to go through and create that new user and promote it. So we can see here, um, first, now that we upgraded our permissions, the first thing we're going to do is go back and get a new access token that just shows our newly increased global administrator permissions. So exact same thing we did before getting it, saving it out into our um, environment variable just to make things easier. Um, so that's going through and doing that. Now we're gonna go through and using that elevated permission, create a new user. So in this case, our new user is called Tim Gambler. And you can see here, we're providing a display name. We say you don't need to, let me pause it. Um, we say you don't need to change your password next time you logged in, it's okay. We provide an explicit password here. So that's that password goes here. We specify the name, the principal name, all of that. And then down at the bottom, you can see here, we're just passing in that new token that we have as part of our bearer authentication. And we're just posting to the user's endpoint. Create a new user. I have the rights. Here's all the data that you would need for it. So go ahead and submit that. Goes through. Successful, our display name, Tim Gambler, now has an actual Entra ID associated with it. We created an Entra user. We didn't create an on-prem user. So now that we know this specific uh, Entra user and their password, we're going to go ahead and take that user by ID and give them the permissions that we want to be able to reset the password. So we're going to take that ID, that role definition, ID that you see down there, this one isn't the global administrator's role, but is instead the password administrator role. All we need is them to be able to change a password. So we'll just give them that permission. Success, we got that ID back. Everything's looking smooth. Now we've created a new user and they have the permissions to go through and change a password. So that was this part. Now, part two, is we actually need to reset the password. So like Andy said, this needs to happen from the context of a user account. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do something a little bit different and we're going to actually use socks and proxy in a browser to go through the UI and make this explicit change ourselves. So we'll go here in Mythic, we'll start a socks proxy on port 7,000. Now in this environment, uh, we have the Mythic server up in, in the cloud. And so I have a reverse SSH tunnel back to myself, exposing the Mythic UI port and exposing this SOX 7000 port back to me. So I opened port 7000 on the Mythic server. I'm bringing it back to myself as port 4444, which is why whenever we edit this proxy chains configuration, 
you'll see that we set the port to 4444 instead of 7000 because I had to bring the port back to myself. So we're using SOX5, standard proxy chains configuration. We're just going to run proxy chains Firefox. And I'll go ahead and skip through this first part a little bit. We're going to go to this portal.azure.com. But if you've ever used um, like SOX and Firefox before, when you first open Firefox, it starts hammering out a whole bunch of requests. DNS looking stuff up, all those little cards at the bottom is trying to pre-populate everything. And as that's all going through the SOX connection, you can see it's all going through. It kind of bogs things down a little bit. So go ahead and skip forward a little bit here. I see everything is going through. And then we can see that our uh, connection finally gets resolved and we get through all the nonsense that kind of Firefox is submitting our way. Uh, one, one thing I want to mention here is the, yep. the reason why this uh, usage of a SOX proxy like this, the reason why this is so interesting is because now that we have this SOX proxy established, the traffic that we're about to create where we are authenticating into the Azure portal is actually coming not from Cody's laptop. It's actually coming from the system where the Apollo agent is running. So if there is conditional access in place that restricts user logons to a named network location, for example, this will satisfy that requirement and it will let us subvert that conditional access policy, even though technically we are running Firefox you know, locally, the traffic is actually being bent through the agent and egressing out of the target network. So it looks completely legitimate from the uh, intra token emission and conditional access perspective. Yeah, all of this SOX traffic is bundled in as part of the agent's normal C2 traffic. So uh, we're finally able to load up the Azure portal login. And we know the login information because we created this user account. So this was the Tim Gambler. We know it's sign in here. And we know the plain text password because, well, we created the account. So easy enough for us to kind of copy over and authenticate. Now, this is a new user. This is the first time we're logging in. This is the first time I'm using this browser. All these things come together where Microsoft is so helpful and asks you to set up a whole bunch of things over and over again. Um, so that's what we're seeing here as each time it starts to go through this flow to authenticate and connect you in, Microsoft is going to try and load stuff up for you, ask you to set things up, welcome you to their new UI, welcome you to the new button that they created, all sorts of stuff that we can finally kind of click through and get access to do what it is that we want to do. So once we get access, Huh, just kidding, you thought Microsoft was done. Once we get access, <laughs> Microsoft is never done. We go to Entra. In here, we can manage on the side, left-hand side, there's manage and users. Just kidding, there's new buttons that you need to be aware of. So Microsoft will interrupt and prompt you there. Okay, we can finally get to the point where we can interact with that David McGuire user that Andy was pointing out. And we're going to reset its password here in the UI. Now, um, you do have to make sure that the password that you supply here meets the password requirements associated with the account. So if the password has already been used before or doesn't meet the requirements, you're going to get an error like this. But we can go ahead and easily tweak this. And so I'll just change the character here at the end and allow us to go through and have this changed for us. So we can see here, success. So at this point, we've changed the entra password, and this data will then get synced down to on-prem and change the on-prem password. So that's what we do here. We reset the password for the entry user, which then has that synced to AD and allows us to now know the password of the David McGuire account on-prem, not in entry anymore. So the last thing that we need to do to actually, you know, do things that we want to do as an attacker is we now need to do something to grant us this new permissions. So the David McGuire account has this generic all on domain admins. So now that we know the David McGuire's password, 
we'll go ahead and authenticate as him locally in, act, in the on-prem Active Directory. We will get a TGT for that user. We'll then use that permission to add the JFrank account to the domain admins, and then we'll be able to access the domain controller. In our case, we will just list out the C dollar share of the domain controller, but just kind of proving that point through. So we come back over here, we're gonna need two things to help us along with this. We'll need Rubius and we'll need PowerView. I went ahead and imported both of those already. You can see these commands down here at the bottom. So what we're gonna do first off is we need to use Rubius and get a TGT for that David McGuire account. So we're gonna use ask TGT. We'll specify the user, we'll specify the password, the one that we set in the UI. Um, I go ahead and copy it up from up here. Remember, we couldn't use this exact one. I had to change the last character to an at sign. We'll change that here. And then I'll specify no wrap, just so it's easier for us to copy it out and the TGT that we get back isn't you know, wrapped by lines. So everything was successful. Here's proving that the Entra password for the David McGuire account was synced to the on-prem one because I just authenticated to the on-prem one with the password that we set. So now we know that all that syncing happened perfectly for us. So I am still in the JFrank context. I'm not in the um, David McGuire or any elevated permission. So just showing now, we can't access C$ dollar on that domain controller. So now we're gonna go ahead and go through and actually use this permission to grant ourselves privileges. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at what tickets are available on the host. We see that we have the JFrank um, care BTGT, his TGT. So we'll go ahead and extract that. Now there are multiple ways, depending on what elevation you're in and if you wanna make um, like sacrificial uh, log on sessions and all sorts of stuff to get around some of these things. Just going for an easy path forward, we're going to extract out that JFrank TGT so that we have it saved. We're then going to take that David McGuire TGT and we'll go ahead and inject that into our logon session. So that will blow away our JFrank one and we'll be authenticating as David McGuire. So we'll see that here, we injected it into our ticket cache. Now, go ahead and list it and prove that it is our David McGuire one. So it's the one we created. We'll go ahead and use PowerPick, and we'll use that PowerView commandlet, uh, add domain group member, to add the JFrank user into the domain admins group. We can do this because that um, David McGuire account had generic all on this domain admins group. Sweet. We can go through. If you ever used PowerView before, you'll notice that a lot of times when things succeed, it gives you no output. So I like to go through and either add in, you know, semicolon done or run it multiple times because if it errors, you get context back. So now we know that the JFrank user has been added in to the domain admins group. Sweet. I'm going to go ahead and go back to that saved off JFrank TGT right here. Going to inject that back into our session so that I'm not the David McGuire user anymore. We'll use that with the ticket cache add, and then we'll go ahead and show that using that access, we can now access DCO1, which is the domain controller. So we got it injected. We can now access the C dollar share, which we couldn't do before. DCO1, C dollar. Perfect. So now we have access our user has been promoted to a domain admin to access these elevated permissions. And that kind of shows the last piece of our attack path here. Now that we have a domain admin account, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that we can do. Nice. I'll go ahead and hand it back off to you, Andy. Yeah, well done, Cody. Um, so if you have any questions about what Cody just walked through, there's the Q&A button in the uh, Zoom GUI. So click on that and ask your questions there. And then when we are done with the presentation, we will address the questions there that we can. So let's go ahead and move on to the rest of the presentation. So, okay. 
So what exactly should defenders do about this? I think there are three things. And the first thing is, as a defender, you first need to identify the risky attack paths. Now, in the real world, most of these user synchronization relationships are completely harmless because the users that are synchronized, they're not going to have any kind of privileges up in intra, um, and they're not going to have any kind of material or abusable relationships down in the on-prem world. So the task in front of you is to figure out what are the user synchronization relationships that actually create risk for either platform. Now, in this example, we had this nice clean attack path where it's very obvious that this particular relationship here between the lower users and this particular relationship here on the upper users, it's obvious that this is problematic. Um, however, when you start to analyze the real world and you start to look at your intra users and, and which ones are synchronized from on-prem, what you're going to realize is that there are hundreds, thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of those synchronization relationships. And so um, the thing you have to do is you have to stop thinking about this in terms of just listing out all of these different relationships, but you really have to start thinking about this from the perspective of the graph. You know, what are the, what are the extending paths that go outward from any of these intra users or any of these on-prem users? So for example, if we were to populate this image a little bit more to see what those next steps are, then it becomes pretty clear that the impactful relationships are these two that we have highlighted here because the entry user on the right side has the global admin role and the on-prem user on the left side has uh, uh, is a member of the domain admins group. You can use Bloodhound you can use Bloodhound Community Edition for free to find these material connections that present some kind of risk. So just to illustrate again, this screenshot here is showing any connection from an on-prem user to an intra user where they're connected by this synced user relationship. And you could certainly go through this and click one by one uh, to figure out which of these entry users have a role or which of these on-prem users have some kind of privilege in on-prem. But instead of doing that, we have a pre-built query built into the GUI for you. And the way you get to it is when you're an explorer, come to the Cypher tab and then click on this folder here, which will open up the pre-built searches uh, list. In this pre-built searches list, select the Azure pre-built searches, and then scroll down here to where it says cross-platform attack paths. And it's here where you can just click pretty easily on any of these pre-built queries to find those material connections that might be creating risk for your on-prem AD or for your intra-tenant. So for example, we have clicked on this query here that says on-prem users that are synchronized to intra users where the intra users have some kind of direct intra admin role assignment. And the result of that is what you can see here on the right. So going from this, you know, kind of hard to work with list we identify very easily which of those connections actually matter. So this on-prem user is synchronized to an entry user that has the help desk admin role, and it also has the user admin role. But more importantly than that, we have this on-prem user, Jay Atkinson, that is synchronized to an entry user, and this entry user has the privileged role admin role. This privileged role admin role is a tier zero role it guarantees escalation to global admin, and there's nothing that admins can do to change that. So at that point, you have identified 
the riskiest connections as far as intro role assignments go. You can also find where there's an intro role assignment through group delegation. And another example, we can find on-prem users that are synchronized to intra users where that intra user has some kind of ownership over something in intra. And so here it's, we can see the attack path that we just got done abusing that, that Cody walked through. So the on-prem user, J. Frank, is synchronized to the intra user, J. Frank. And this intra user owns not only the IAM uh, application, but it also owns this intra uh, device. So once you have knowledge of which connections matter based on the attack paths that they enable, your second step, in my opinion, should be to eliminate those attack paths that you can. Um, I like this phrase that says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Or put another way, if we have an attack path that an adversary might be able to discover and execute, we might be tempted to just leave that there and put uh, detection mechanisms in place, or maybe put conditional access policies in place to try to mitigate that. But what Cody and I and every uh, everybody else who has ever done red teaming professionally knows is that no matter what control is in place, there is a way around it, almost guaranteed. But if the attack path doesn't exist, the adversary cannot abuse it. So in my opinion, it is much more effective to eliminate the attack path as opposed to trying to only mitigate it with compensating controls. I really like this quote from John Lambert. I like a lot of quotes from John Lambert. But here he says, prevention is the guardian of detection. Prevention creates the white space to detect and respond to the most important things. I, I agree with this 100%. So earlier we saw how we can identify the, you know, synced user relationships that matter because they create risk. And we can focus on those uh, and, and ignore, you know, all the other noise or all the other connections that don't create any risk. But in the real world, uh, sometimes for legitimate business operations or continue, uh, uh, continuity reasons, these attack paths may need to persist. So you better know about them. You better get rid of the ones that you can. But let's be realistic. Sometimes these configurations have to remain. And so the final thing that you should do is that you should mitigate those attack paths that have to remain for some legitimate business reason. One example I can think of is with this I am automation service principle that we were talking about before. There are legitimate third party tools out there that have basically either global admin or the equivalent of global admin. And they need that because they are third-party tools that are doing uh, just-in-time administration for you. So they are promoting users to global admin. They are demoting users from global admin. And so behind the scenes, the way that that application is doing that is very similar to what we showed in the attack path for that particular piece, where there is a service principle out there that is authenticating, that is performing these privileged actions, it needs that kind of privilege to do that. If you get rid of that, if you get rid of that attack path, you break the application, which is not an option. And so, like what John says, we get rid of everything we can so that we can create space, so that we can create very high fidelity and very high importance alerts for what remains. There's a good blog post from Microsoft recently uh, authored by Alex Weinert, uh, called How to Break the Token Theft Cyber Attack Chain. I highly recommend reading this and implementing what you can in this blog post. So 
that is the conclusion of this particular topic. And we have some other thoughts as well. So one thing you might be interested in is what are we working on next? And I have an answer for you. And the answer is right now, what I am working on personally is this concept of host equivalency. So now we have user synchronization edges in the product, and we can find these attack paths that go through user synchronization relationships. What I'm working on now is host equivalency. And that means you could have an on-prem Active Directory computer, which is actually hybrid joined to an intra ID tenant. Maybe it's also managed by Intune. Maybe it's also an Azure virtual machine. So that one host is currently modeled and represented across all these different systems. And we model it and present it in the product as different things as well. What I'm working on now is creating the relationships between those different nodes that tell you this is actually the same host. So we've compromised this on-prem Active Directory computer. And at no cost, we have also compromised an Azure, an Azure virtual machine. And maybe it has a managed identity assignment. Or maybe we compromise an Intune managed system, and that has intra users who are logged onto it. The next thing that I'll be working on is group sync and group write back. So, group write back just went general availability recently from Microsoft, where you can actually create an intra group and that will actually replicate down to a new uh, group in on prem Active Directory. And that on-prem Active Directory group can then be managed by principals up in intra. So I'll be looking into that. And then, of course, there are other possibilities as well. So Azure Arc is a good example. Uh, just the concept of federated identity itself, uh, certificate-based authentication, et cetera. And so we have our eyes on other hybrid and inter-platform attacks of, of all different kinds. If you're interested in learning more about the tradecraft associated with the attack path that Cody demonstrated, I have some uh, recommended reading and viewing for you. So uh, check out the work here by Alex, Daniel, Adam, and Melvin. Melvin just had a great uh, stream on Sunday that uh, walked through a very similar set of actions that Cody showed using Mythic. Check out this work from Dirkion. Fabian, Nestori, and Renos as well. We're going to send out a follow-up email that will have these links in it. So don't worry if you can't click on these right now. And so that brings us to the conclusion of our prepared material. Um, Bloodhound CE and Mythic are both free and open source products. You can get Bloodhound at this link here. You can get Mythic at this link here. We hang out in the Bloodhound Slack. You can get an invite there at this link and join us in the Bloodhound Slack. We are also running a t-shirt campaign right now. And so you can buy this t-shirt that has this cool art on it. And all of the funds, all the profits from these shirt sales uh, are being donated to the American Cancer Society. Last thing before we get to the Q&A is SpectreOps is hiring so you can check out the available roles we have here. And our colleague, Dwayne Michael, just wrote a great blog post talking about the internal working culture that we all enjoy here uh, that gives you some real examples of what people who work here experience and, and what uh, people who work here are able to achieve. So check all that out. And now let's check out what we have in the Q&A. So the first question here from Henrik says, instead of owner on the app, would having a PIM enabled for pulling the owner permission on the app, would that have blocked the attack? You can, through PIM scope access to an enterprise app via cloud app admin. So I think I see, I think I see like maybe two different questions. One is maybe, maybe, maybe the second question you have is, could you do this abuse if you were something other than the owner of the app? And the answer to that is yes. So there are various intra ID admin roles that enable that, and those can be scoped to the tenant or they could be scoped specifically to an app registration. 
And there are also MS Graph app roles that enable adding secrets to app registrations and to service principles. So the user being the owner of an app, that was just the, that, that's just one way that, that can be abused, but there are certainly many other ways. Now, the first question you have here, let me reread this. It says, that instead of owner of the app, would having PEM enabled for pulling the owner permission on the app block the attack? So if I understand the question correctly, it sounds like maybe you're asking um, if this were a PEM eligible assignment as opposed to it being permanently J. Frank being set as the owner, would that have blocked the attack? It certainly would have made the attack take longer because as the adversary, we would have to sit on that host and wait for J. Frank to escalate themselves or activate that assignment for themselves. Or the PIM activation might be misconfigured so that J. Frank is, enable, is able to activate that assignment for himself without MFA, without secondary authorization, et cetera. And that, that would cause like a little bit of a speed bump, but not that much. If it were where PIM it requires MFA to actually activate, if I'm the adversary, I'm looking for a different path because I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to do like an MFA exhaustion attack or anything like that. Or I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait for J. Frank to activate that assignment for himself and wait for that token that has that claim in it that I'll steal from the system and then replay that and, and do the attack. The second question here is really good. This says, how would this play out if 2FA is required like Duo? This is a great question. So... um. This is a great question as well, because Microsoft is rolling out required MFA for all Azure portal logons, and then eventually uh, logons for like um, uh, Azure Active Directory PowerShell client ID as well. So currently the, the Tradecraft uh, basically comes in two different flavors, I would say. The first flavor is we have password material for a user, and we're going to uh, use that password to get a token. And at that point, we're having to worry about MFA. So there are MFA exhaustion attacks, there's social engineering, whatever. But the second thing to know is that MFA only occurs at the point of authentication. Once the token has been emitted, MFA has been satisfied. And so in the attack path demo, Cody was Cody was pulling a token off the disk. And if we dec if we um if we decoded that ticket, um, we would see that that, that that token actually has the MFA claim in it. MFA has already been satisfied. So MFA is not a silver bullet in this in this world. Once the token is emitted, that's it. Um, as a well not counting like continuous access evaluation or or a revocation of those tokens. But even then, if we are SOX proxying the traffic through the host where the user does their, their regular actions, as the adversary, we can try to mimic the actions that the legitimate admin is taking as closely as possible. And that's going to subvert the MFA uh, contract, I would say. Good question. Next question, is the sync fairly instant or is it set on a periodic interval? Great question. So the password write back, that is actually, that's actually a pull action that is happening from on-prem. And so there's an on-prem agent that is constantly pulling for password reset jobs. So in effect, that's instant where the Password change is going to happen on the intra user and the on-prem user at the same time. Now, if we did a password reset on the intra user through a different endpoint or as a service principle, that's not going to write down to on-prem AD and then the user credentials go out of sync. There's also from on-prem up into intra, there is a periodic interval for synchronizing, for example, new users that are created. Off the top of my head, I don't remember the exact interval. I think it's 15 minutes, but I could be wrong about that. Um, 
This next question says, is there a benefit of using the enterprise version versus the community version of these attack paths? And so the answer there is yes. The, the benefit on using the enterprise version as opposed to the free version is the enterprise version is going to do all of this discovery and analysis for you. And the enterprise version is also going to assign risk ratings to these different um, uh, findings that it will produce as well. Uh, the free version doesn't have that capability, but the free version still does have all of the same information as far as the graph and the attack paths go. Another great question. This says, for the cross-platform attacks, will the data gathered on-prem, for example, with Sharphound, be enough? Or do we also have to get the data with Azure Hound? So really, you need to use both. Um, you could just use Azure Hound, and Azure Hound is going to have the information it needs to know that a intra-user is being synchronized from an on-prem user. And Azure Hound is actually even also going to be able to see what the SID of that on-prem user is. But that's it. It's not going to be able to see the display name of the user. It won't be able to see any attributes from the user. It won't be able to tell how privileged the user is or anything like that. So really, practically, you need to use both. Uh, here's another question from Henrik that says, what about fish resistant MFA? So like, uh, like the number challenge in the Microsoft Authenticator app, is that the same deal still? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. So no matter what the MFA technology is, once the token is emitted, MFA has been satisfied. And so in my opinion, these changes from Microsoft where they are pushing people towards MFA, like forcing people to be using MFA, in my opinion, that's going to push adversaries towards token extraction abuse primitives, not MFA exhaustion or password guessing or any of that. So token theft is going to become much, much, much more relevant as Microsoft makes these changes that make the initial authentication process more, um, uh, more full of friction for users and other identities that are just doing their initial authentication. Great question. Uh, this next question says, has the abuse info been added to these new edges in the current Bloodhound release? And the answer to that is yes. So as of uh, two or three weeks ago, the week before Black Hat, uh, these edges are there and the abuse info is there. And then also um, references uh, and everything else that you would expect to see on the edge entity panel has been added in yes. Cody... Maybe I can get your help answering this question. So let me read it. It says, you mentioned that when doing socks, we are using the compromise, win compromise machine to egress. Would this apply if there is a geo block? So if, if I understand the question correctly, it's like, if we are limiting inbound authentication requests from a certain geography, would this, would this bypass that? And... So the answer there is yes. If if the legitimate machine on the LAN is in one of those geo locations, or if it's in one of those named network locations, the traffic is going to come from the from that host. And so, if if I answered that question correctly, then uh, let me know. Or if there's a follow up that or or clarification, uh, please uh, let us know as well. Yeah, that's how I understood it. Understood the question. Okay. There are two other questions here. Let me answer. So this one says, do or could the attacks highlight applied to free intra-ID accounts associated with Office 365 tenants where the account and group data is synced? That's a good question. And I don't have a very good answer for you right now, but um, Office 365 is, is another research area for us that we will be moving into when we can. Um, so. I'm sorry, but I, I don't really have a good answer to that right now. And this next question might be the same. So it says, are you considering adding AD IDNS nodes to Bloodhound? 
Um, maybe. Uh, it depends on what the practical abuse possibilities are for that particular class of object in Active Directory. Maybe. I'm just not quite sure yet. Here's another great question. It says, if you don't allow synchronizing passwords from Azure to on-premises, is there still a risk? So, yes. Um, there's a great blog post from Dirk Jan, uh that says, obtaining domain admin from Azure AD by abusing cloud Kerberos trust. So there are several different federated authentication mechanisms. Password right back, you would kind of think of being kind of like one, um, but Cloud Kerberos Trust is, is a formal, um, what, I, what I would call a formal federated authentication mechanism. If that's set up, then we don't need to rely on password right back. We can just use the mechanics of read-only domain controllers to create uh, service tickets for the on-prem users after having stolen the secret from Azure AD or, or from Intra rather. That's not the only one. There, there are other federated identity um, mechanisms like pass-through authentication or ADFS um, that can enable the compromise of the on-prem user uh, from either having control of the Intra user or having control of the Intra tenant. And then the next question from from uh, here is, uh, can you can you only allow MFA authentication to corporate devices? So, uh, I I believe the answer is yes. So you could design a conditional access policy that limits from from the signals of the authentication request, including the named network location, or if it's a trusted device or the device ID, you can you can apply certain controls based on those signals with conditional access. So you can require MFA if the authentication request is coming from a corporate device. But then you also said, can you only do that if it's coming from a corporate device? I think today the answer is yes. I think going forward after Microsoft makes the changes with um, forcing MFA on these logons. The answer might be different. I don't know. Um, they haven't shipped that requirement yet, so we're not sure yet. This next question. Are you considering adding PAM eligibility to roles in Azure as edges? Most of our admins are doing just-in-time administration by now. And the answer to that is yes. We're also working on that right now. So we're working on PIM eligibility roles, uh, role assignments in Intra and in Azure. We're, we're working on that uh, currently. That is the end of the questions that we have from the Q&A feature. So again, I want to say thank you for taking the time out of your day to hang out with us on this webinar. Uh, let me go back to the conclusion slide so we can see these links. And the talk was recorded. You'll be able to see the recording using the same link that you used to register. Um, Cody, any parting thoughts? No, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you for the great questions. Yeah. Have a great day, everybody. And uh, yeah, thank you.